Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Washington, D.C. at the conclusion of a Mitchell Institute uh, nuclear deterrence uh, breakfast where our speaker was Dr. Uzi Rubin, uh, an extraordinary uh, Israeli strategist, one of the fathers of Israel's uh, missile defense uh, networks, including the Arrow, which in Hebrew is the Hetz uh, system. You're with the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies as well as the Sadat Begin Center for Strategic Studies. See, Uzi, you're a strategist, whether you like it or not. You're two strategic think tanks. Uh, you gave a really compelling uh, presentation on Iran's capabilities and how dramatically they've improved. Every year you visit Washington uh, around this time of year, and there have been a lot of events that have happened where Iran has really demonstrated an enormous amount of capability. Talk to us about some of the specific things Iran is doing that you find most worrying and threatening at a time when tensions are, are rising uh, over Iran's nuclear capabilities, some of its other belligerent actions, and its missile programs. I think Iran's uh, military doctrine is very impressive. It's uh, centered on two ob objectives. First, it's access denial, not occupation and not overrunning other countries, but access denial. On it's one one of goal. The other goal is power projection, and the means part of the power projection is to a quick proxies with their own power projection capabilities, like Hezbollah against Israel. Uh, so you see this policy of this two-pronged policy with these two prongs complementing each other. And uh, the, the purpose of the whole thing is to uh, make Iran dominant in the Middle East through the use of its uh, very uh, prolific proxies uh, all over the Middle East in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, and in Yemen, and there are other uh, places too in the Gulf which are not in the game yet, but the Iranian would love to put them in the game. And uh, talk to us specifically, I mean, one of the compelling cases you made in looking at Iran's strategy was how air power is not that important. You noted that, for example, in 2014, uh, Iran returned 130 aircraft back to the uh, Iraqis uh, that had been seized in the 1991 war. Talk to us about how missiles and offensive missiles and increasingly precise offensive missiles teamed with unmanned systems are really proving game-changing in the region. Oh, definitely they are game-changing. Let me go back to many years ago and a uh, quote, an Iranian uh, quote caught my eye. What they said, roughly, I can't quote it, I don't remember it verbatim, is that we, we the Iranians, analyzed the way the West makes war and developed a countermeasure to every one of their uh, doctrines. And, and uh, this is the uh, realization of this. They are fighting unsymmetrical. They are, they, are de they are developing the hybrid unsymmetrical uh, 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 warfare, where they are not playing the West's game. They are not developing large maneuvering forces. On the contrary, they shun them, they don't invest them, and that includes air power. Instead, they bring in the asymmetric assets, which are very hard to defend against. And they are asymmetric in both senses, both in the material sense and in the spiritual sense. That means they are designed to fight not just the West's military power, but also to uh, leverage the West's own uh, inherent uh, taboos and uh, norms about war making. They, they use that to leverage against the West, including, for instance, the tactic of uh, uh, human, human shielding of their uh, rockets and missiles. This is done purposely because they know that the West is shunning, attacking uninvolved civilians. Uninvolved in parathesis, because once the civilians are being, are shielding it, they are involved. Uh, so you see them, how they are leveraging the West, are waging the new uh, post-liberal uh, values of the West in order to tie the hands of the West uh, against the means, against the means that they deploy in order to uh, harass their enemies. Basically, they are not fighting armies, they are fighting societies. This is the main driving thing, fighting societies. Uh, the target is not to defeat foreign armies. They have no, no, no idea about defeating the bulk of the US uh, forces on the ground. What to defeat is the society behind the army, body bags, like Saddam said. Bring the body bags, break the spirit of your uh, 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 enemy and not necessarily break his uh, military. We see that the Hezbollah, Hezbollah is very explicit about the, the renewed way of waging war. 
taking the Israeli weaknesses, societal weaknesses, and, uh, and, 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 and exploiting against a society, and they are doing the same thing all over the place. They are exploiting differences uh, between tribal differences, different religious differences, in order to defeat societies, and for that, of course, they apply force. But they apply judiciously, very economically. They don't spend the billions and the zillions for hordes of tanks and fleets of combat aircraft. They spend much sparingly on missiles, which can do the same thing. And I showed this morning how with a few missiles, you can uh, defeat uh, bigger organizations just by a few successful hits. So I'm still sitting there and I'm, let's say, I have grudging admiration to the almost brilliance of their uh, uh, strategy. And we in the West have to wake up to that and understand uh, that this is a strategy and uh, try to overcome our own tendency to fight wars in the old way. Uh, talk to us about the precision strike capability and the ways that, you know, you, you wrote about this actually many, many, many years ago about, you know, what wizard war and what the future was going to look like. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how the Iranians have demonstrated operational precision in very impressive ways from your standpoint as, uh, as both a missile expert and a missile defense expert, uh, and how they're tying that in to drones and increasingly, you know, for lack of a better word, um, suicide drone, you know, using drones as actually inexpensive cruise uh, missiles to um, really prove very destabilizing, including attacks uh, on pipelines, for example. Well, uh, you, you asked, uh, in one question, you asked several questions. Let me try to address uh, your question, uh, parts of the question by one by one. Uh, the most impressive demonstration was intentionally demonstrated was the attack on Koya in uh, September 2018 on the headquarters of KD KDPI, the headquarters of the Kurdish, uh, Iranian, Iranian Kurdish uh, underground, where they managed to take out most of the commanders by a um, salvo of about eight precision missiles fired from about 200 kilometers away. A job like that would be given in the West to air power with um, advanced aircraft, each one costing $150 million, dropping precision bombs costing $100,000. They did it with simple rockets that were endowed with precision, not too reliable, probably one third one to one quarter of the rockets failed. But the rest did the job with two judici judicious hit on the headquarters, not just had the headquarters, the exact room where the headquarters was emitting, they had good intelligence. They managed to uh, cause uh, uh, infinite pain to that uh, organization. I don't know if they took it out of uh, action, apparently not, because uh, commanders can be replaced. But that was very impressive. That was a very impressive use of good technology used judicially for military purpose. Another area is how they integrate UAVs into the rest of their uh, 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 ar ar armed components. Um, they, they, they are very aware of missile defense, very, very aware, actually, for years. They were uh, already making statements about how they are going to overcome missile defenses back in the 1990s, as early as that. They are very aware of Israel's uh, programs, they are very aware of the American programs, they are following them very closely and developing what they think is of means to overcome them. And we see those uh, UAVs integrated into uh, this uh, strategy in two ways. One is using UAVs instead of missiles. That means something which is cheap and flies below the battle space of the missile defense. Missiles cannot uh, have the difficulty hitting very low flying targets. Uh, and especially with the drones that don't come in ballistic trajectory, but in kind of arbitrary, meandering uh, air profiles, air flight profiles. Um, so they can use them as uh, ersatz, uh, very cheap. Guzman's, again, the, the, the economy of the whole strategy is, is, is admirable, I must say. Grudging, I'm an engineer, not just a strategy. So I cannot help myself admiring the smart use of technology. And this is low technology, not high technology. The other thing is by using those UAVs in order to uh, attack the missile uh, uh, system themselves. Missile systems are very vulnerable. They have vulnerable parts, like the radars, like the battle management. Uh, okay, they're the launchers. They destroy launchers, they can bring another one. But the radars are almost irre irreplaceable. 
So they are using that to what success, I don't know. It's not in the literature. And of course, uh, the Saudis are being attacked, uh, rightly so. Don't, don't release any details. But they are doing it. There's no denying that they are doing it. So you see their UAV industry and capability being integrated with their missile capability and anti-missile defense uh, strategy. And they've integrated that well into a battle management and intelligence network as well, right? Definitely. If they knew where that uh, KDPI headquarters is going to meet and when, well, it's good intelligence. And the room. And, and the room. And the room. They, they hit the exact room where the meeting took place. The um, uh, operation like uh, attacking uh, the pipelines from distance of 100 kilometers need a lot of uh, coordination a lot of planning, a lot of command and control, again, was impressive use. Although the weapon itself is low-tech weapon, something that is almost uh, university, faculty kind of workmanship. But the use of it was sophisticated and showed sophistication and good command and control. Um, strategists for a number of years, uh, the last administration in particular, was talking about uh, the United States and its allies losing the precision advantage that uh, United States, Israel, Europe uh, have enjoyed for a long time. What's the response to this kind of um, capability and threat, right? This is turning tables uh, on us. What are the ways uh, that the United States, Israel, and its allies have to respond to a threat like this that is for sure going to proliferate as uh, the Iranians are working very hard to spread this capability around the world? Well, it's both defensive and offensive. Uh, in defense, you have to take into account that uh, what used to be statistical weapons are now precision weapons. They can be taken out. I mean, they're, 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 they can be shot down like, like any missile. But now you need to shoot all of them, not just some of them. So it's not a technical problem, it's an economical problem. You have to invest more in your defenses than you thought that you wanted to defend. The other thing is uh, offensively. I mean, what they can do, you can do too. They rely, instead of air power, on missile power, ground large missile power, and uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's very appealing. Think about that. They were sitting there in that uh, town in uh, Iran. No plane took off. No pilot risked his life. They were sitting in an air-conditioned command uh, shelter, just pushing the button, and lo and behold, a few minutes later, they killed this whole uh, command structure. Well, for the, in the West, a comparable thing would be to take a couple of F-16s, risk the pilots, load them down, use huge air bases, very vulnerable one. Uh, you look at these two things, said, uh, hey, who, who's modern here and who's behind? Do you th think that it's time for uh, nations to build strategic rocket forces? Generally, democracies have moved away from that kind of capability. Uh, the Iranians clearly see even uh, non-nuclear weapons like this as strategic weapons. Is it time for Israel, the United States, and other service, uh, nations to build strategic long-range rocket forces? Well, the, 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 the use of the term strategic is confusing because in the West, strategic usually means nuclear. Okay. I, I'm talking about long-range strike capability and pow power projection by non-nuclear means. The way the West does project power with non-nuclear, what's called conventional, I hate the word conventional. When you get a 500 kilogram bomb on your hand, it's not conventional. It's mass destruction without nuclear. Uh, so uh, we're talking about non-nuclear uh, weapons. The only uh, way the West now uses them in a meaningful way is by uh, via air power. Or, or, cruise, or light, lighter uh, weight cruise, cruise missiles. Very long-range cruise missiles, but those are used for very, uh, I'd say, um, rare occasions. You don't use them as battlefield weapons. It does use them as part of the your force structure. It's, it's a standalone arm to demonstrate uh, reality, retaliation, to show your uh, dissatisfaction. No, the Iranians are using that in order to wage war. And I think that the West also uh, should shed off some of the um, legacy of the Second World War, where air power won the war for the West, and uh, go back, uh, actually save money by using the same uh, strategy of using uh, standoff ballistic weapons as uh, power projection and, and battle and uh, war winning uh, capabilities. Not strategic, tactical. 
Um, you uh, are an engineer, uh, but you're also uh, a strategist. Your, your PhD is in political science. Um, talk to us a little bit about, and you've watched Iran for a very, very long time. I remember having had these conversations with you in Israel uh, as uh, Iran has evolved over the past uh, decades in terms of its capability, its strategy. What's the best way to contain uh, Iran now? There's a, the administration has uh, moved out of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, now it's asking for another nuclear deal, given the Iranians are stepping up nuclear production. What's the best way to handle this situation from your standpoint? Uh, the president didn't escalate. He didn't uh, do uh, the attack uh, that many expected him to do. He called that off, uh, you know, as you've said, not to fall into uh, an Iranian trap. What's the right way to deal with Iran to de-escalate the situation and to denuclearize the country? but also have it be a more constructive actor on the world stage, right? Because the last administration's attitude was the nuclear deal will put a wealth, an infusion in cash into Iran, and they will become more peaceful. I think uh, the miscalculation of your, allow me to say, of your previous, previous administration was, and I'm not sure that the present administration is also thinking in this term. I recommend look at Iran as the new Soviet Union. Contain it. This means a mix of military measures and diplomatic measures. Uh, to contain them, you need to build pressure, uh, you need to apply direct threat, you need to apply economic threat. You have to divest them from the source of military and sophistication nourishment, like uh, you're admitting uh, to until this very day. As we are talking, there are Iranian students using in your faculties, in your technological faculties, uh, learning how to make uh, high, high, high technology stuff and go back to Iran. We are talking about missile proliferation. This is worse than missile proliferation. This is know-how proliferation. My recommendation is to cut Iran away from these capabilities because you didn't allow the Russians or the Soviets to study in your schools during the Cold War. Think Cold War terms against Iran, not against Russia. Russia is not, uh, it's in competition, it's not Cold War. China too is in the competition, but not Cold War. Iran is a Cold War. They are out to kick you out of the Middle East. They are out to kick out the West from the history. They are a real threat. Cut them off from uh, economical connection, cut them off from cultural connection, cut them off from know-how, sources of know-how. Try to cut them off from their allies. I'm not recommending which deal or that deal you do with other things, but, but think about the combination of containment, diplomacy, and military measures. The main thing is f mind frame. Think Iran as the new Soviet Union and try to apply the same method that were so successful against the Soviet Union. Where, what, what room is there for carrots in that strategy? What are the kind of carrots you would offer them to uh, bring them out of their current position and getting them to where you need to be, right? So threat and force is part of that, sanctions are part of it, but what are some carrots you might offer them as well? What, what, what are the carrots you use against the Soviet Union? You, you offer the Soviet Union. You offer them that if they behave, uh, they'll be uh, rewarded by uh, behavior. So, but they have to behave first. The previous deal was disaster. Was disaster not because of the details of the arms deal, of the nuclear deal. Deals have three levels of meaning, any deal. If you buy and sell a piece of land, it has three levels of uh, significances. First, there is a contract, and what's in the contract binds. But the second level is what's not in the contract doesn't bind. And the third is that you made a contract with the party, that means he's trustable and you gave him legitimacy. And to my best criticism on the nuclear deal was not exactly what's in the deal, but the fact you legitimized one of the most, uh, 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 I'd say, radical uh, 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 regimes in the world today. I'm not talking about the Iranian men in the street. The Iranians are good people, and I know some Iranians are fine people, and I wish the Iranian people all the best in the world. By the way, we asked the Iranians what they have against us, and we, we can't understand it. Uh, historically, Jews and uh, Persians had uh, a history of uh, friendship. In modern daytime, before, uh, before in modern days, before uh, the Islamic regime came to power, we were very friendly with the uh, previous regime of Iran. Uh, we had nothing against them. We want nothing from them. We are more than 1,000 kilometers away. We want nothing to belong to the, that belongs to them, and we don't understand what they want from us. So I'm, I'm not speaking about the Iranian people. I wish them all the best. But the Iranians are now uh, ruled by a bunch of uh, very radical and extremist people who are on a mission of God to 
reshape the world in their own mission, similar like previous uh, uh, revolutionary regime. Think about the Bolshevik regime, about uh, revolution over the world. Uh, they are about the same kind of people, very fanatic about their ideas. And those people you have to, you cannot take them out of power. They are shielded by the 90 million, or say 80 million uh, Iranian. You have to bring them down to size. And the way to do it is you have to brought the, United, the USSR down to size by a mixture of uh, means, diplomatic, economical, and military. Uh, you know, when you were uh, mentioning, uh, you know, Iranian Israelis, Shaul Mufaz uh, came, uh, you know, there were a lot of Israelis of, of, of Persian uh, ancestry as well uh, in Israel. Let me ask you a uh, last question about the threat from hypersonic uh, weapons. The entire focus, uh, or there's a very, very big focus looking at uh, whether it's Russian, Chinese capabilities, concern that others are going to have that kind of a capability as well. As somebody who's as expert a missile defender uh, as you, what are some ways to think about warfare in this new regime where the speed of the munitions and the maneuverability of the munitions and potentially their area denial capabilities could be very, very game-changing? What's, what's some of your thoughts on that as somebody who's devoted his life to you know, missile, uh, missile defense and missile offense and the challenges that go with it? Well, uh, let me say the first, uh, the word hypersonic is now a hype. Uh, the old SCUDs, uh, the longer range version of them, used to fly a few ballistic trajectory and come down in hypersonic speed. But nobody called it hypersonic. I mean, now uh, it, it reminds me of the Sputnik uh, syndrome. That means everybody knew that the Russians are going to have ICBMs. But nobody gives a damn about it until they flew the Sputnik. And then all of a sudden, here was the, the horrible Soviets. Now they can attack the United States. Same thing, I think. Putin's uh, speech, May 1st, uh, 2018, was the same thing. Warning about uh, maneuver uh, uh, hypersonic glide vehicles were there actually in the 90s already, 90s, 20s. I remember myself speaking here in Washington in a close conference in sometimes, I think, 2008, showing slides of Russian AGVs. But nobody gave a demo about it until Putin came up and all of a sudden hypersonic is a great thing. Hypersonic means hypersonic uh, gliding, not the speed is not the important thing. The, the important thing that it's maneuvering, it's gliding, it's translating uh, a potential energy into kinetic energy and can uh, give you a lot of flexibility and confuse missile defenses. So uh, let me first say that uh, those new Russian weapons are aimed to defeat U.S. missile defense, which doesn't exist. Uh, U.S. missile defense is limited with limited number of, uh, purposefully so, against very limited strikes of simple ballistic missiles from North Korea and have nothing to do with Russia, and Russia is developing those uh, systems to fight an imaginary enemy that doesn't exist. But technologically, it's very impressive. I don't, don't deny that. Strategically, uh, I looked at that and said, what, what the hell is he doing? He's uh, willing to spend his rubles for that? Uh, okay, I, I would have spent them somewhere else. But technologically, very impressive. Um, now, let me say this. Whatever is invented by man can be de-invented by other men. There is nothing that cannot be defended against. The hypersonic glide vehicles and all other the hypersonic maneuvers you can pose a, a new problem. It makes the life of defender difficult because it takes out the predictability, both of the trajectory and the target. You, know what, you, you don't know where the target is. With classical uh, ballistic weapons goes minimum energy. You, you observe the, tra the trajectory, and after a while, you can know, you know more or less who's, who's, who's going to be in the impact point and defend that impact point. With the uh, uh, new uh, um, atmospheric skipping weapons, you are not sure which one of the targets is the target. You're not sure how it's going to behave. Uh, let me make uh, a revelation here. Hypersonic maneuvering was invented in 1944 by a German called Eugen Singer, who uh, with his wife uh, published a very detailed German paper on a hypersonic glider that takes off on a rocket uh, in Germany, makes its first dip above New York, drops its bong, and then skips around the world back to Germany. The whole science is there. All the equations are there. You want predictability? Go to that book and build your predictability back and pick your weapons around that. Everything can be defeated. It takes time, though. Uh, one follow-up question on that. Is that 
why it's time for much deeper layered systems than perhaps the approach the United States and some of its allies are taking, which are sort of much more point defense focused? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Uh, defending the assets is, uh, as it's, a, it's a matter of economy. Uh, just defending assets, point defense is very expensive because you have to put your defense, uh, you have to duplicate a lot of defenses. Area defenses are more uh, economical because you put one system that defends uh, several targets. So it's really a matter of economy, not a matter of technology. You can do it this way or that way. Dr. Uzi Rubin of uh, the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies, as well as the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies as well, uh, one of the fathers of uh, Israeli, uh, Israel's missile uh, defenses. I should also give a shout out to Yair Ramadi, who was uh, one of your partners uh, on that, also one of, uh, one of the two giants of the Arrow program. Sir, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure seeing you, and I hope next time uh, we get a chance to speak, it'll be in Israel. God willing.